This discussion is going to focus on the pelvis and hip. So again, we're kind of moving down the kinetic chain. We had talked about the head, neck, and trunk. Obviously, there's a <clears throat> pretty good connection between what goes on, particularly at the lumbar spine in relation to the pelvis and hip. So we'll get to see some kind of crossover from that taking place. So looking at the pelvis and hip, so we'll talk about the primary purpose of this region. If you remember going back to the shoulder, we talked about how the primary purpose of the shoulder, if you had to like summarize it in one basic thing, was to put the hand and arm in a position of function. Well, when we look at the, the pelvis and hip, it's kind of a similar concept. However, with the pelvis and hip, if you look at us, given the fact we walk, run, jump, the, the primary purpose of the pelvis and hip is power production during closed chain function. So unlike the upper extremity, which primarily, you know, day to day works mostly in an open chain scenario, the pelvis and hip works in a closed chain. If you just think about, again, our, our movement and everything, um, the, the pelvis is really important for that. So the primary purpose is, is power production in closed chain function. Our other functions of the pelvis, so the pelvis provides a stable base, particularly for uh, when we look at the relationship to the lumbar spine. It, can, it has visceral content, so it does actually have a, um, a protective function for the, the contents of the lower part of the abdomen. So the, the pelvic bones will actually provide some containment, and even a little bit of protection for those, particularly on the, the, the lateral surfaces. And it helps to transmit forces. So the, the hip ten, will transmit forces kind of coming up through the lower extremity and also involving the, um, the, the lumbar spine. So we look at the hip joint structure. It has a major role in locomotion. One of the important things that we're going to be pointing out is the functional differences in muscle activity when we look at open and closed chain activity. So again, this is really important, and this is why I tell you, make sure you go back and review your basic functional anatomy here, because we're going to be talking about you know, different functions that the muscles are going to have based upon, again, gravity, positioning and in and closed chain versus open chain okay so there's going to be some slightly different things that go on with the muscles with this and again if you don't have kind of the basic function of the muscles down it, it's going to be a little bit it's going to be a little confusing so the pelvis and the femur again we talk about support and protection of the abdominal viscera Again, some other functions that we had, had not mentioned quite yet. We, it, the pelvis and femur looks to support and transfer the weight of the head, neck, and trunk to the femurs and standing into the ischial tuberosities and sitting. So we had mentioned that <clears throat> a little bit briefly when we talked about the head, neck, and trunk, about kind of that dynamic when you're standing versus sitting, kind of how the, the, the forces are transmitted. When we look at the pelvis, so the, the pelvis is made up of the innominate bones or the os coxa, so that's your, your innominate bones, your ilium, your ischium, and your pubic bones. Um, they are gonna rotate during walking to create ryth a rhythmic pelvic swing. So we're gonna talk about both motion at the pelvis and actually most motion at the acetabulofemoral joint uh, or the hip joint. We're gonna talk about those separately. Uh, the pelvis also does act as a very broad area for muscular attachment. There's a lot of muscles from the hip and abdominal region that all kind of um, attach to the pelvic area so that it creates a very broad area for that muscular attachment. Looking at the femur, so one of the anatomical, important anatomical landmarks of the femur is the greater trochanter. And, and interestingly enough, the, the greater trochanter actually has some pretty significant function. Uh, one, it, it's, we know that it is the insertion point for both the glute medius and the lateral rotators. And the, the structure of the femur is actually important for that because what you do is it actually allows increased torque and leverage for those muscles to operate. So by having that, that greater trochanter, that kind of a, that, that big lateral projection off of the femur actually allows for that to take place. <clears throat> 
Um, you also have, uh, it also is a point to allow you to measure for leg length um, when, you're, when you're measuring the femur. And then you have the femoral neck angulation and the acetabulum. So the acetabulum is where the head of the femur uh, articulates to form the hip joint. And you're gonna see that femoral neck angulation again, that's gonna be very important for force distribution. And we're gonna talk about the, the relevance of measuring that. So femoral neck angulation is actually something that we look at clinically uh, whenever we're doing an examination of the, of the hip area. So here is your, we talk about the different angulations of the femur. So the femur has a couple different angles. So here we're looking at the, what we call the angle of inclination. So this is our frontal plane angle, okay? So the frontal plane, we look at aligning the knee and the femoral head within the same weight bearing line. So if you look at the, the picture, and this is also in your textbook, okay? We're, we're, looking at, we're looking at this angle. So this is a frontal plane measurement the angle of inclination, okay? The average is about 125 degrees, okay? That's about what we look at as being normal. And again, that's gonna be important for, for force distribution to kind of distribute stress appropriately throughout the femur. Again, having the, the, the greater trochanter out here provides leverage for those lateral muscles that, that come in and attach and allows for greater torque to be produced at the, at the hip joint. When we look over here, we see the difference between normal and abnormal angles of inclination. So uh, again, obviously normal, you see here they're showing normal 120 to 135 degrees. The average is about 125 degrees. Um, when we look at the two abnormal measurements that you would have, and we could talk about some of the issues associated with them. If we look over here, um, now they're saying greater than 135, really Cox of Alga, anything beyond 130 um, starts to be considered cox of alga. And the issues that occur with this are you get um, increased leg length on that side. So you can see how that would increase leg length. You're basically, um, <clears throat> you're increasing the angle of inclination. It's gonna make the leg a little bit longer. That's gonna produce instability at the hip. The other thing this is gonna do, if you think about what we said, it's gonna decrease the leverage of the hip muscles. So we said that, you know, the greater trochanter, and if you look up here, kind of that angle coming out allows for increased leverage. Well, if you lose that, which you would be with this cox of alga, you're gonna have decreased leverage of those hip muscles. On the other side over here, cox of era, which is a decreased angle, and we look at less than 125 degrees, being cox of era. So now we see that that angle starts to get smaller. And this can actually occur later in life due to arthritic changes as people get older. So what this does is this actually predisposes the femur to fractures, particularly up at the femoral neck. If you think about this angle being almost kind of almost getting a little bit more flat, almost getting parallel with the ground, how the forces would be transmitted through there and possibly predispose the individual for fractures. So again, you don't wanna to have too much or too little of anything. You kind of want it to, to be this, this kind of optimal angle, which provides the leverage and allows for the appropriate force distribution. Here's another angulation of the femur, and this is what's known as the angle of torsion. This is a transverse plane measurement. So this looks at a, um, a rotational deformity, and you can kind of see it in here. They're actually showing a transverse plane cut. You can see where the normal angle of torsion is. You can see when there's excessive, what we call antiversion, um, excessive antiversion coming anteriorly, excessive retroversion, where that angle's coming a little bit more posterior. So this is a slight medial twist of the femur. So it's basically a line that's going to bisect the head and neck proximally, and then another line that's gonna bisect and connect the medial and lateral femoral condyles at the distal end. So if you look at this picture, again, always orientate yourself to, to any illustration, and this one's in your, in your book, but you can see how they're kind of showing the, in a dotted line, the, the, fe, the distal femoral condyle. So it's basically looking at alignment in the transverse plane of the head and neck with how they orientate to the femoral condyles, okay? 
Normal for this is about 10, it's in the 10 to 20 degree range, okay? They're showing here normal being 15, which would be, you know, basically right in the middle of that. Um, again, if you have what's called excessive antiversion, where the head is kind of rotated out a little bit more, um, that's going to cause some hip instability issues. It's going to cause increased medial rotation and decreased lateral rotation. And the posture you see with that in standing is this towing in, okay? So when you see individuals who tow in like this, now you have to check the hips versus the lower legs because this could also be a lower leg issue, but if it's up at the hip, this could still happen. So the compensation, you see this kind of like little blue outline. So if the femoral neck is kind of twisted a little bit more anteriorly or orientated in that fashion, you get this towing in. The flip side of that is femoral retroversion where it's it's coming back, okay? So your angles actually, we're talking usually less than 10 degrees with that. Um, and you get this towing out posture, okay? So antiversion causes the towing in, retroversion causes towing out. <clears throat> now we also have some angulations at the acetabulum. So um, these, there, there's not a whole lot to measure for clinically here, but these are things they would look at to see if there's some you know, particular hip joint issues, usually with some, some diagnostic studies. So you have what's called the central edge angle. Now, again, this is another frontal plane measurement. So make sure you're noting what plane these measurements are in. And because it, it, number one, I want you to be able to recognize them. Number two, it has the, the measurements actually make sense for what you're looking at. So the center edge angle, this is what we're looking at over here is the center edge angle. Okay, it's a frontal plane measurement. Larger angles mean greater containment of the femoral head. Okay, which means that you're going to have greater stability. However, um, obviously you have to make sure you don't have too much bony overgrowth because then you could also cause problems with that. Um, but here, the way this basically gets measured, you take one line vertically um, that comes basically right from, they, they measure it right from the middle of the femoral head. And then you have one line that extends just lateral to the acetabulum. So basically the, the reference point for this line right here is the edge of the acetabulum, which you can see. So again, straight up vertically from the middle of the femoral head and then go back to the femoral head and draw it out. So in other words, if this, this at the edge of the acetabulum extended out to here, the line would come out further, okay? And basically, again, as far as measurements for this, uh, less than 20 degrees, the person has the possibility of having um, some hip dysplasia because they're going to lose some of that uh, stabilization at the at the uh, acetabular femoral joint. Larger than 25 degrees is considered um, normal. Then you have what's called the acetabular antiversion angle. Again, this is another transverse plane measurement. So we're looking at it over here. We're looking at a transverse plane slice. So you're basically looking down on top of the hip joint, okay? Uh, basically, the way this gets measured is you have one line exactly in the sagittal plane, okay, coming out. So you see off the anterior margin, off the edge of the acetabulum coming straight through. And then you have another line, an, an oblique line that's going to come and it's going to go along the margin. So this is your acetabulum right here, okay. So again, right off the anterior portion of the acetabulum, sagittally, straight line, then you're gonna have another one at an angle that covers the margins of the acetabulum. Normal for this measurement is 15 to 20 degrees. Um, greater than 20 degrees means there's less containment of the femoral head, which means it's gonna place more stress on the hip joint and cause arthritis. Less than 15 degrees means you have significant coverage. So this is kind of an interesting point. So with this angle, Okay, the larger it is, the more coverage you have. With this one, the less, the less, the, the, the smaller the angle, the more coverage you have. And if you think about it, it makes sense if you orientate yourself to the way you're looking at it. So in a normal person, this angle's bigger, this angle's smaller. If, if a person has kind of normal, normal bony anatomy, and then that will, you know, create for a kind of a normal environment for the hip to be put through the, the stresses that it needs to be put through. <clears throat> 
So ephemeral acetabular impingement. So these are some things we look at as far as, you know, when we look at kind of bony abnormalities. So as I said, you know, we, we want to have large angles of, of center, center edge angles to make sure that there's good stability here, but obviously too much. If you get really big, so again, normal is greater than 25 degrees. There does reach a point though where you could have too much and you can get what's called a pincer impingement at the um, femoral acetabular joint. So basically what would happen is the soft tissue would get impinged as this hip is trying to go through its range of motion because you have an ex extra growth kind of coming off the acetabulum. Over here, you're getting what's called cam impingement. So basically the structure of your acetabulum is good, but the issue is now you have your bony overgrowth on the femoral neck, okay? So these are just kind of showing some examples of where you could have some bony anomalies that could possibly cause impingement. So what this would basically mean is in either case, when the hip would go through its range of motion, it might kind of catch and pinch some of the soft tissue Again, similar to what you look at at the shoulder with the rotator cuff, um, when either there's an anatomical issue or there's a movement issue. This obviously is more of an is an anatomical issue because um, the, it's basically the structure of the individual's bones that are causing it. So looking at the different joints, we have our hip joint. So our hip joint is a ball and socket joint. It is three degrees freedom of motion. So again, very similar to the, the glenohumeral joint. You can flex, extend, you can abduct and adduct, and you can internally and externally rotate. Obviously, the, the difference here is that, again, while the hip still needs to have a great degree of mobility, because of the fact we're weight bearing and we have so many big forces kind of coming through the hip joint, um, it does have to have much more stability. So again, when you, you know, to look, if you really look at a, uh, an anatomical model or illustration kind of showing you while both the hip and shoulder are both ball and socket joints that allow a good deal of motion, the hip joint is much more stable than the glenohumeral joint because it needs to be because of those forces it has to take on. If we look at the acetabulum, so if we look at first, even before we get into the articulating surfaces, the acetabulum. So the acetabulum is going to face um, anteriorly and laterally. Um, the concavity that, that it kind of develops is going to be due to the weight bearing forces as one ages. So, you know, as you learn to walk as a young, you know, young child, you start to get that increased concavity in there. The articulating surfaces of the acetabulum. So this is an interesting point because the head of the femur doesn't necessarily touch per se the entire acetabulum. The primary articulating surfaces are the anterior, superior, and posterior sides. And that superior periphery has articular cartilage known as the acetabular labrum. So much like the glenoid labrum in the shoulder, the acetabulum also has a fibrocartilaginous uh, structure that also furthers to deepen the, the articulating area for the, for the hip joint. Uh, the central area of the acetabulum does not have any cartilage. So, you know, the acetabular fossa, um, the, the fossa itself does not contact the femoral head. There's a fat pad for sensory input and an area for synovial fluid to kind of move through the actual joint area itself. And then there's the ligamentum teres. Now we're gonna talk about some of the other hip joint ligaments later on in the discussion, but the ligamentum teres, which you can see in this illustration, um, the, the ligamentum teres connects to the, what's called the faveva. So the faveva is a part inside the acetabulum and the, the ligamentum teres isn't so much a stabilizing ligament, but it actually carries the blood supply to the, to the femoral head. So that's one of the, the, the main functions of the, the ligamentum teres from, uh, from a structural standpoint. Now, in looking at this particular region, we're going to look at the joints, but we're going to look at it from both the open and closed chain perspective, because again, the, the primary function of, 
the the hip and pelvis is to you know produce power in the closed chain so and given the fact that we tend to use the lower extremity in the closed chain just in day-to-day -day life we're going to discuss both so I'm talking about the hip osteokinematics. We're going to look at movement of the pelvis on the femur. So we're looking at the closed chain. So actually, when we're looking at the hip joint itself, we're looking now at the concave surface moving on the convex. Now, the movements that the, take place at the pelvis are both anterior, posterior tilt, lateral tilt, and protraction and retraction so anterior and posterior tilt are in the sagittal plane the lateral tilting is in the frontal plane protraction and retraction is actually going to be in the transverse plane um, also looking at anterior rotation and posterior rotation now <clears throat> one thing to note that protraction and retraction are kind of paired movements so anterior, posterior tilt, lateral tilt, you could have one side doing that motion and the other side not. In other words, you can get an anterior tilt on one side of the, the pelvis and the other side doesn't necessarily have to do it. Protraction and retraction have to occur together. In other words, if the right side of the pelvis protracts, the left side has to retract and vice versa. So that's why they're, they're a paired movement. Um, one of the things, again, that's very important and this is something that gets emphasized a lot in rehabilitation, particularly for low back issues, is neutral pelvic positioning. So we want to encourage neutral pelvic positioning that's going to put the lumbar spine in its kind of natural posture. That's the neutral pelvis is going to be when the ASIS and the PSIS are both parallel with one another, and the ASIS is in vertical alignment with the pubic symphysis. So that's going to be something that's important. Now, when the pelvis moves, when you kind of take the entire pelvis, put it in either an anterior or posterior tilt, that's going to affect movement at the lumbar spine. So when you put the pelvis, if you were to put the entire pelvis into an anterior tilt, that's going to put the lumbar spine in a greater lordotic curve, which is basically essentially producing greater extension at the lumbar spine and the, the muscles responsible for an anterior pelvic tilt are going to be the, the iliopsoas, so that the hip flexors and the erector spinae. Posterior tilt, when you put the uh, pelvis in a posterior orientation, that's actually going to flatten out or flex the lumbar spine, and that is gonna be pr produced, that movement is going to be through a force couple with the rectus abdominis and the glute max. So now looking at the hip osteokinematics, so now we're looking at the femur on the pelvis. So now we're looking at more uh, open chain activity. So we're looking at the convex surface moving on the concave surface. So we know that our motions, we have flexion, extension, abduction and adduction, and medial and lateral rotation. Um, some normal joint range of motions at the hip. Uh, Flexion, you're going to have about 120 degrees, and that's also with the knee flexed. Obviously, with the knee extended, you typically have less hip flexion. Uh, hip extension, 10 to 20 degrees. Abduction, about 45 degrees. And then about 45 degrees of lateral or external rotation, and about 35 degrees of medial or internal rotation. As far as the joint end feels go, um, most of the joint end feels are firm due to stretching of the soft tissue. Uh, the one exception to that is typically it's going to be soft when you do hip flexion with knee flexion. So usually when you measure hip flexion, which the, the best way to measure hip flexion is with the knee flex because that tells you true hip flexion because if you extend the knee, there's some um, passive insufficiency that's going to occur. So <clears throat> that end feel should actually be soft because you should be approximating the anterior uh, the anterior thigh to the abdomen when you bring the, the hip up. Um, if you kind of get a firm end feel with that, then you're looking at some, some other tightness with the hip, but all of the other end feels uh, should be firm due to soft tissue stretch. So again, Arthur kinematics, it's important as we talked about to discuss open chain versus closed chain activity. And with the, again, that's important to understand at any joint, but 
we're emphasizing this a little bit more with the hip just because of how the, the hip joint kind of works typically. Um, so when we look at some of the Arthur kinematics, when we're looking at um, as far as, you know, a lot of the roll and slide relationships, when we talk about flexion and extension purely in the sagittal plane, you're actually getting um, some spin taking place. So we haven't talked a whole lot of spin. We talk a lot about, you know, roll and slide. Um, so pure flexion, you're going to have a posterior spinning, pure extension in the sagittal plane, you're going to have an anterior spin. All of the other arthrokinematics are very similar to what we discussed with the shoulder joint. When you talk ab and adduction and internal and external rotation, the hip operates the same way. The, the, the joint structure itself, while providing a little better stability than the shoulder does, it all still works the same compared to the, the shoulder joint. As far as the open and closed pack position, the open pack position for the hip is flexion, abduction, and external rotation. The closed pack position is extension, medial rotation, and abduction. Now, some factors affecting muscle activity, and again, from the standpoint of analyzing movement, it's going to be really important that you kind of understand how the muscles work because while, again, all our muscles have kind of their classic, you know, basic function, with the hip, due to the fact that there's so many muscles working, you're looking at, um, you know, look working in the closed chain, you know, with or against gravity. So again, if you're having issues with your functional anatomy at the hip, make sure that you review. Um, there's, and again, there's some great illustrations and great sections in all these chapters kind of showing the anatomy um, that you can certainly utilize to kind of help your studies. But there's various factors that affect muscle activity. Number one is the number of joints it crosses. So we deal with a lot of very important two joint muscles across the hip joint. What are the positions of the other joints? That's going to impact the, the muscles, the size and cross section. Uh, leverage, okay, so we, we talked about lever arms and, and moment arms in the earlier chapter. The, that's going to impact the, the muscle activity and the strength. What type of contraction is taking place? So you should be starting to understand based upon even some of the things we talked about in the lumbar spine chapter, how different types of muscle contractions are going to affect activity. Again, when you're analyzing movement, you have to be able to see, is the, mu is the muscle lengthening or is it shortening? Is it trying to control motion um, against gravity or is it trying to, to produce the, the actual um, prime movement of the muscle? The segment's position relative to gravity, what type of movement task is being carried out, Look at the load that's being moved or stabilized and how fast the motion is taking place. So these are all factors. Now these factors affect muscle activity anywhere, but as we'll see with the hip joint, this becomes a, all these issues become uh, very amplified just based upon a lot of the things we do in day-to-day -day activity. So looking at muscle line of pull and leverage. So you know, due to the large hip range of motion means that changes in hip position may change muscle action. So depending upon the position that your hip is in, it could slightly change how those muscles will operate. Okay, so again, muscle action is determined by its line of pull in relation to its axis of motion. So take, for instance, the, the TFL and the glute medius. Okay, so both the TFL and the glute medius abduct, but they can also medially rotate when the hip is flexed. Okay, so the TFL and the glute medius, when the hip is flexed, can also produce some medial rotations, particularly when you look at the glute medius, more specifically, its anterior fibers. Okay, so when you look at the anterior fibers of the glute medius, they're going to produce some medial rotation when the hip is actually flexed, okay? Um, there, there could be some medial rotation taking place with an extended hip with these muscles, but the force is a lot greater at 90 degrees of flexion. So at 90 degrees of flexion, you're gonna have a much stronger medial rotation coming from both of these muscles. 
Um, in some instances, the muscle can actually change its action. So again, this is where we got to kind of have the basics down before we kind of understand how this actually occurs. So again, so a muscle could literally change its action based upon the positioning and it could actually do its antagonist action. So in other words, the piriformis and the adductors are good examples of this. So the piriformis actually becomes a medial hip rotator when the hip is flexed. So the piriformis, which we know is one of the six deep external rotators, when the hip is flexed, it actually changes its line of pull and becomes a medial hip rotator, okay? Um, the adductors, okay, the adductors will act as a hip extensor when the hip is already flexed. Um, however, when in neutral, they will actually act to assist with hip flexion. Okay, so again, these are showing some, some different examples that will actually show how some antagonist muscle actions actually begin to occur depending upon the position of the hip. And some larger hip muscles actually have segments that work in co cooperation and opposition to one another. So a good example of this is the glute max. Now we know the glute max is a very strong hip extensor, which we're gonna be talking about in a little bit, but the upper portion of the glute max, the glute max is actually a, a pretty big muscle. The upper portion will actually assist with abduction and the lower portion assists with adduction. Now, so what I'd tell you is go in, in, in your, your textbook, if you look at how the glute max actually comes down along the posterior hip, you could kind of see some of that. Um, with the glute medius, uh, we know it is again a hip abductor. We talked a little bit about the anterior portion being a medial rotator and the posterior portion actually being a lateral rotator. So that's another larger muscle that has some segments that kind of work um, in different fashions, okay? Now you say, well, why does all this happen? Well, th by, do, by allowing this, by allowing some of these muscles to kind of kick in with some of these actions, depending upon the position of the hip, it actually makes your movement more efficient um, because it requires less muscle activity from the prime movers, okay? We still want the prime movers to work as they are, but we, we know that by having some of this assistance coming through these secondary actions, it actually makes our movements much more efficient. So these are just some illustrations from the, the book kind of showing some of the examples as to how these muscles work in this fashion. And, and there's a lot of other really good examples in the book um, that I'm gonna direct you to. So make sure you're kind of looking at this. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at this action of what the, the adductors do, so if we, we look up at this picture, so here's the, the sides extended, okay? So here's your axis of motion. You see here the adductor longus when the hip is extended, where its orientation is. When you flex the hip, you notice how now the adductors kind of fall in line to actually assist with hip extension. So they actually kind of change their orientation and that then uh, changes that line of pull. If we look down here, this is what we talked about with the piriformis, okay? So you can see the piriformis here, the way it lines up is that it's showing it from the standpoint of how, you know, the piriformis is an external rotator when the hip is extended when you increase the flexion range of motion, it now changes the piriformis into a medial rotator when you're, um, once you flex the hip. So muscular sufficiency, there, there's a lot of two joint muscle, uh, muscles that cross the hip joint, okay? So again, you know, when you look at the two joint muscles that cross the hip joint, you have the rectus femoris, you have the sartorius, you have the tensor fascia lata, the gracilis, the hamstrings, those are all two joint muscles, okay? And we know that for muscular sufficiency, we get greater force at one joint when it's lengthened at the other. So when we have shortening at both joints, that produces active insufficiency, okay? When we have it lengthened at one joint, that's gonna allow for the optimal function of the muscle at the joint we want. So be thinking about, for instance, with the hamstring. So with, with that being kind of said, 
when we look at the hamstrings and the rectus femoris, what would be the strongest positions for them to operate at the hip, looking at the hip and knee? And what would be the strongest position for the hamstrings to work at the hip, looking at the hip and the knee? Okay, so I want you to think about that. That'll be something that, again, we, we, we discuss in class a little bit more, but I want you to think about that. So for the, for instance, the rectus femoris to operate at its best at the hip, what does it mean for knee position and then the same thing with the hamstring? We're looking at weight bearing versus non-weight bearing function. So in open chain tasks at the hip, the, the primary goal typically is speed of movement. So for instance, if you think of, uh, just think of like a soccer player going to kick a ball with their kicking leg, okay? Um, that, that kick, primarily what we're looking is to generate more velocity. So usually in open chain tasks, we're looking primarily at speed of movement. When we're talking closed chain tasks, we're looking at more primarily more forceful contractions. Okay, so a little bit more of a, a strength-based uh, forceful contractions to do that. So going back to if we were to look at, again, just the soccer, just something as simple as a soccer kick, you know, they're going to kick the ball with their, say, their right leg. That's going to be an open chain task. Primarily speed of movement is going to be the issue there. In the closed chain, the opposite side, you're looking at forceful contractions because you have to stabilize the body. Okay, you're not going to be able to kick the ball very hard if you don't have that other side stabilized. So that's just one example. And again, if you just think of just, you know, things that are all open chain versus closed chain, you could kind of see some of the, the different um functions coming there from the standpoint of speed versus uh, more, more forceful strength-based contractions. So if we look at muscle activity, so if we look at the hip flexors, so which, would be, which muscle would essentially, given the, the nature of what it means for muscles, what would be the strongest hip flexor? So I want you to think about that. Which muscle would be the strongest hip flexor? So write that down and put that in your notes. Um, when we're looking at muscle activity, again, we have to look at whether we're looking at open chain, closed chain, whether we're looking at the pelvis on the, the femur or the femur on the pelvis, okay? So if the pelvis is moving on the femur, we know that we have a force couple with the iliopsoas and the erector spinae to produce anterior tilt of the pelvis, okay? Um, that's gonna be a, a, an important function for again, controlling that, that pelvic motion. When we look at femur movement on the pelvis, we're gonna have the hip flexors and the abdominal muscles working synergistically um, when that takes place. So those muscles will have to work synergistically when you produce uh, movement of the femur on the pelvis. So in both cases, we're looking at hip flexion, okay? So if we anteriorly tilt the pelvis on the femur, that's hip flexion, okay? It's closed chain hip flexion, but it's hip flexion, okay? And again, that's gonna be a combination of the iliopsoas and erector spinae. If we look at the femur moving on the pelvis, which is what we classically think of, obviously we have the hip flexors, but the abdominal muscles are going to work as well, um, and they're gonna work in synergistic fashion. Again, I want you to think about what the strongest hip flexor would be. Okay, hip flexion and standing. So hip flexion and standing is going to be produced by a combination of the iliopsoas, the rectus femoris, the sartorius, and the TFL. Um, now, we obviously know that the sartorius and the TFL also produce rotation, but they're going to kind of cancel each other out. So if we're looking at just we want to produce straight sagittal plane hip flexion while standing, those two muscles are going to kind of work synergistically to kind of cancel that motion out so that you could produce that, um, that hip flexion. And again, maximal torque is going to be produced by when those muscles are placed on a slight stretch. We look at hip flexion in sitting. The TFL and the sartorius are going to have decreased contributions. So, you know, obviously then now we're, we're kind of taking those two muscles out and you're going to be primarily looking at the, the other hip flexors that we discussed. And we look up sit-ups and straight leg raises. So in these cases, when we're talking about these, these classic movements, um, the, 
the abdominal muscles are going to work synergistically with the hip flexors. Okay. So that's going to be an important kind of uh, relationship when we're doing these. So when you do a sit up, the abdominal muscles and the neck flexors are going to initially contract. Um, so that's going to kind of get your, your upper back sort of off the ground when producing a sit up. If a sit up actually continues, so, you know, when you do what's, you know, more of a classic full sit up, the abdominals actually begin to operate isometrically and you're actually getting more concentric activity from the hip flexors than you even are from the abdomen if you're doing full sit ups. Um, now, again, the issue there is the potential, you know, particularly for someone who has low back issues because of the origin of the hip flexors being on the lumbar spine, there could be a little too much anterior shearing taking place that could become an issue for a person with an unhealthy low back. When you do the straight leg raise, it's actually reversed, okay? So if you're lying on your back and you go to lift both of your legs up straight, that action's going to be reversed. You're going to have initial contraction from the hip flexors and then the, um, then the abdominal muscles will take over towards the end of the movement. Um, now, if you do that unilaterally, you can stabilize the pelvis with the hip and knee inflection. So if you were just doing a, for instance, a straight leg raise with one side, if you flex the opposite hip and knee, you kind of stabilize the pelvis a little bit more, and then that reduces the amount of, of shearing force taking place. So if we look at hip extension, again, I want you to think about what the strongest hip extensor would be. And again, if you did the reading prior to this, you should already know. But I want you to note what the strongest hip extensor is. Now, again, think about this. Again, we're going to talk about this from the standpoint of both the open versus the closed chain. So, you know, the pelvic motion is obviously now going to be a posterior tilt. Okay. So if we're, we're talking about the, again, closed chain um, activity of the pelvis moving on the femur, what would the, what would the pelvic motion be? And that would be a posterior tilt, okay? Um, the hamstrings as far as a, and this should actually read hip extensor. So we're actually going to... Cross that out, that was a mistake. And that should say, so how would the hamstrings be most effective as a hip extensor? So think about the, the concept of active, of active insufficiency. How would we create optimal sufficiency for the hamstrings to act as a hip extensor? And think about what other muscles did we say could produce a hip extensor movement. We talked about the adductors. So the adductors, when the line of pull are posterior to the axis of motion, the adductors can also act as a hip extensor. Okay, so looking at continuing to look at muscle activity, so talking about hip extension in an open chain. Um, Again, hip extension when you're in the prone position, that's usually kind of how we, you know, we look at hip extension. Um, with the knee flexed versus the knee extended, think about what muscle would impact the, uh, you know, where, where the muscle activity would take place when you have the knee flexed versus the knee extended. And again, how do the hip muscles that do extension contribute to hip rotation? So for instance, the glute max will do some lateral rotation, the medial hamstrings will do medial rotation, the lateral hamstrings, the biceps femoris, will do lateral rotation. And then we look at unilateral versus bilateral hip extension. So with unilateral hip extension, the pelvis will remain a little bit more stable and you'll get some synergistic contraction of the paraspinals. With bilateral contraction, you're going to get an increased demand on the spinal extensors and you're also going to get a much greater stretch of the, the iliopsoas. So it's important to note that if you're doing any type of hip extension strengthening exercises to know how that's going to actually impact the, uh, how that's going to impact the spine and the, the spinal muscles.
So still looking at hip extension, if we look at stance and sitting, um, a lot of the, the muscular activity is going to be controlled at the hip joint, okay? So when you're, you're bending over to pick up an object, you gotta be thinking about what type of muscle activity is taking place. So we talked about this in the chapter on the, the, um, the head, neck, and trunk. When you're bending over to pick up an object at the hip, and again, we want most of the motion to take place at the hip, you're going to be having eccentric activity taking place. So again, it's, it's important to understand these, these different types of muscular activity. So when you're, when you're hinging to pick up an object, you're getting eccentric contraction. So your hips going into flexion, but the reason why it's occurring is because you're getting eccentric contraction of the glutes and the hamstrings in order to do that. Um, when you think about the muscle activity of walking upstairs, the hip and knee activity. So when you're going up, you're getting the combination of hip and knee extension, which is gonna allow for that kind of optimal sufficiency of the, the hip extensor movements to take place. And again, when we start to talk about rapid or forceful contractions at the hip, it's very important for the glute max to be the, the primary movers. That's where you're going to get the, the best and most forceful contraction at the hip joint. So we look at frontal plane motion at the hip. Um, again, I'm gonna ask what would be the, the strongest abductor at the hip. So I want you to think about that. We have other muscles that are going to produce hip abduction. We have the TFL, the glute minimus, the sartorius, the piriformis, and the upper fibers of the glute max are also going to produce abduction. The glute medius is very strong with hip abduction due to its large mechanical advantage. And again, think about at the beginning of the chapter, what did we say produces that large mechanical advantage? Okay, it's the greater trochanter. So the glute medius comes down, attaches at the greater trochanter. So if you could picture, if you didn't have that large lateral projection off of your femur, think about how that would impact your movement, okay? Um, and then when we're talking closed chain activity here, what action is the muscle performing at the pelvis? And we're looking at lateral pelvic tilt. And we see this, the most, the most glaring example as to how this occurs and when this occurs is when we walk. When we're in unilateral stance in order to keep our pelvis stable, the, the glute medius and the hip abductors need to operate in order to balance out the pelvis, okay? So this is important to keep the pelvis stable um, as far as muscle movement that occurs. You're also going to get some abduction of the hip from the piriformis and the sartorius, both when the hip is in a flexed position. So here's kind of an interesting thing we don't think about. Um, we haven't talked a whole lot about levers again, but to kind of bring that uh, practical discussion of how levers work. So the glute medius at the hip actually works as a class one lever, okay? So if you think about it, again, here's your class one lever. So when you're walking and your, your stance leg is down in the closed chain, remember your, your body's trying to balance out your pelvis, so here's your, here's your glute medius. So again, here's your class one lever, your effort and load are on opposite side. So if you look, here's your, here's your, um, your axis is obviously the hip joint, right? Your load is on one side, your effort's on the other, and that's producing that, that stable balanced pelvis. So there's an example of, again, levers in the body. We talk about most of the levers being class three. In the case of the, the glute medius, that's a, an example of a class one, and you can see that most um, obviously when you look at the, at, the, at the stance leg and gait. Still looking at frontal plane motion, so the motion of adduction. Um, again, when we talk about the function during pelvic motion, um, they're primarily acting, the adductors are primarily acting as stabilizers. So the adductors do help to stabilize the, the pelvis particularly look at supporting the pubic symphysis. The line of force is gonna vary a little bit with each muscle. 
So when we look, for instance, at the adductor magnus, so the adductor magnus, we talked about how when the hip is already flexed, the adductors will work as hip extensors. The adductor magnus, and the adductor magnus is a very large muscle, um, its posterior fibers actually work as hip extensors in general, regardless of, of hip position. Now, as you flex the hip, they get a little bit greater advantage, but those posterior fibers of the, pec of the adductor magnus will work as hip extensors. The pectineus, um, while it's an adductor, will also work to flex the hip, is also um, a muscle that will work with hip flexion. So we look at transverse plane motion. Again, we talked, if we're looking at the pelvis, so with pelvic rotation, again, remember I discussed that these are paired motions. So the actions of protraction and retraction or um, uh, the rotation of the pelvis, they have to occur together. So unlike lateral tilt and anterior tilt that you, you can actually get on one side versus the other, protraction and retraction always have to occur as one motion. They're a paired motion. And the, the muscles responsible for the movement looking at the hip and trunk are going to be your hip rotators and your trunk muscles. So when we're looking at pelvic rotation, looking at movement of the pelvis on the femur, all your hip rotators and trunk muscles are going to contribute to that motion. Now we look at movement of the femur on the pelvis, looking at hip medial and lateral rotation. You have to consider the hips position in the other planes. Okay, so the muscle activity is going to be dictated a little bit by how is the hip position? So is the hip in extension or is the hip in flexion? Okay, so for instance, when the hip is flexed, for instance, the upper fibers of the, the glute max, for instance, are going to contribute to medial rotation. Same thing with the anterior fibers of the glute medius. Okay, so the, the glute maximus will contribute in that manner. For the adductors, um, they're going to also contribute to medial rotation of the hip. Some other medial rotators that we have to think about, again, we talked about the anterior fibers of the glute medius, the TFL, and also the anterior fibers of the glute minimus. Obviously, we know lateral rotation. We're talking about the six deep lateral rotators at the hip. And these are your, your learning outcomes. <clears throat> so very similar to the learning outcomes. Again, most of the learning outcomes, the, the, the general aspect for each joint region is very, is very similar. And we have you know, little nuances particular to each region based upon their, their function.